Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of Beyond the Rhetoric. I said last time that I was going to talk about the isms that are so common in society. And again, this is um, this series isn't about me uh, preaching truths that I've learned as much as it is me trying to uh, engage a little more thoughtful uh, reflection on some of the um, maybe simplistic thinking in our society, uh, especially as we exaggerate uh, the other instead of trying to come to understanding on things. So today we're going to talk about um, the isms of capitalism, socialism, and a little bit of communism um, to explore maybe some uh, some definitions of them, some some misconstruals of them, some critique, critiques, and whatever. But at their core, capitalism, socialism, and to a lesser extent, communism, are really economic theories, right? They're just, um, I think they've evolved into ideologies, but they're, they're economic theories, you know, which, which attempt to, to explain um, how society should be organized based on whatever. So capitalism, uh, strictly speaking, uh, is defined as a system in which the means of production, so um, you know factories or or any any businesses or whatever, but they're these are owned by individuals. They're privately owned. And the idea behind this, uh, usually, it's based on the on the notion of the the free market system, in which um, individuals or corporations or whatever have to compete against each other that that process of competition will regulate prices, um, will keep everything to where it's high enough but low enough uh, in a fair way and lead to the most efficient system and therefore the best products, the best services. Um, and I think implied in it is that uh, a, a form of meritocracy, if you will, a form of those the best ideas win, the people that are, that are most capable uh, be either because they work hard or they're smart or whatever, um, will win in the system. It's kind of, um, I think a lot of times we, we, we see it's, it's based on kind of a notion of social Darwinism, right? Uh, this whole notion of um, the best will survive is that. And it also, I think, very often refers to uh, or implies a certain human nature, that humans uh, by nature are greedy, that, they're, that we're self-interested, and that instead of trying to fight against that tendency, we should organize a system that benefits from that tendency. And I think this is the influence that Ayn Rand uh, had on it in her, in her famous Atlas Shrugged and other writings, um, which I, dis I personally I disagree with. I've, I've read Atlas Shrugged, and I think this is it's hugely flawed. But I think there's something to be said for this notion that um, if we have a system where people benefit from being successful, then it gives them an incentive to to try to to it gives them an incentive to think about solutions that otherwise maybe they wouldn't think about. They wouldn't invest the effort thinking about. And I think implicit in this is, as well is that. Um, you know, what's the alternative? If it's not privately owned, then then what? Government's going to own everything? You know, so uh, this is at, at the core of, of, um, of America's psyche. I, th I think, you know, either uh, you're a huge fan of capitalism or uh, people in America maybe are, are critiquing capitalism, but that's because capitalism is so interwoven um, in most everything, uh, most every institution uh, in the United States. Of course, the problem comes in, as with anything, um, when instead of being a theory, meaning this is how we think things work, this is how we, this is a system that we think would, would provide the best benefits, when it turns into a truth, as if somehow we know for sure that the capitalism, as articulated by somebody, or as implied by a lot of people, is the truth, and that anything other than that would fail miserably. And I think whenever I see that, that's, I'm always concerned. When I look at, I've, I've done work around uh, how people become extremists. And, and that's one of the things that, that to me, is just um, always there. And that is 
when you switch from, you look at something saying, oh, this is a, um, a tentative truth. This is a, we think this is how things work. And when somebody takes that and moves it to, no, this is the truth. And I will look at everything through this lens. I will never question this. I will use this to question everything else. That's when it, it starts operating as an ideology. And of course, taken to an extreme. I mean, and I don't think there are many people that think this, but taken to an extreme, if everything was privately owned, um, now, granted, because capitalism says that the means of production, but what does that mean? Um, uh, so I, I listed here, for example, public schools. Is that a means of production or is that something the state should provide? Whatever. But, you know, if you take it, if you take the, the thinking to an extreme, there should be nothing collective, right? No public schools, no state roads, no public works, no welfare, no social nets, social security, whatever. Uh, no fire departments, no police departments, no libraries. None of these public things because, no, private ownership and this competing, um, if we had private libraries and they had to compete with each other, then we would have the best library system. And I just, I just think that's wrong. I, I, I think I could point to a lot of examples to where that just doesn't seem to be true. Um, but that doesn't mean that capitalism is wrong. The capitalism is inherently of no value, nothing, nothing like that at all. I think, it, I, like I said before, I think there's a lot of benefits that come from capitalism. Um, but as with anything, I think when it when it becomes this ideology, that's when, when we start seeing um, some problems come up with it. But now we get to what seems to be the modern day version of the antidote to capitalism, uh, according to some, and that is socialism. Now, again, technically, whereas capitalism means that the means of production is owned by individuals, socialism means that the means of production are owned by the state. And the thinking here is that uh, the free market doesn't deliver what's best. It ends up benefiting the few uh, and really hurting the many. And uh, the best outcomes come from us collectively doing things that serve the public interest. Well, again, in my mind, I think, oof, once we're talking about some of these things that I'm used to being under more of a socialist control or a state, a state control, such as um, streets, let's say, I don't want private individuals running the streets. I don't want any private entity to be able to say um, things like, well, streets um, are going to benefit some and not others, and it's my choice because I can do it any way I want. The free market will tell me if I'm wrong, but I can make the free market, uh, I can control it a little bit, especially when you control something as central as transportation. So the idea behind socialism is we just take it completely the other way. And you say, well, if we, if we can't trust private individuals to work for the common good with streets, then we can't really trust them with anything. And so everything should just be owned by the state and the state will determine whatever. And the thing behind this is that, you know, solidarity, solidarity of this pooling of resources for the common good, that's what's best for everybody. And um, yeah, one thing I, I find interesting here and, and I, this is me, I, I'm going a step far. So I think somebody could critique me and say, Chad, you know, that's not necessarily true. But, you know, in capitalism, I said it's based on this notion that, that humans are inherently self-interested. And so capitalism takes that and uses it uh, for everybody's benefit. And I don't think that's, that's uh, it's wonderfully true. I, don't, I think I could question that. But under socialism... Especially, I don't know, I think Lenin very famously said that um, you know, he looked around and said, how can I build a socialist uh, country here with the people I have to work with? And so um, he, he concluded that either he had to send a lot of them off to gulags. Uh, Stalin's known for that, and Stalin was a, was a monster. But Lenin started this whole, uh, this whole system of sending political people that were not educatable um, off just go away, get out of our hair so we can build a socialist thing here. And then we have to educate from the ground up, from, from childhood up, so that we can create a socialist being. And I'm thinking, well, if you have to work that hard to mold people, and I've got a huge problem with that, right? When you mold people from the outside, you determine how other people need to be. That, that's a little more controlling than I'm comfortable with. And if you have a system that relies on that, that's telling me that may not be a good long-term solution in the system. Now, a counter-argument to that counter-argument for me is that capitalism does the same thing. We just, um, I mean, there, we've been so indoctrinated into being 
good little consumers and caring about um, what shoes we're going to wear. And the most important thing is whether I use a certain kind of phone or whatever. You know, we've, we've all been shaped. It's impossible not to be shaped by your social surround, whether that's the formal education system or just your immediate family or the television and other forms of media that, you, that are in front of your eyes all the time. We're always going to be shaped. So I, I don't like the thought that uh, if Lenin was right and socialism requires a specific shaping of people in order for it to work, I'm thinking that may not be the best solution to have. But at the same time, I, I, I think um, capitalism benefits from, from having that same kind of uh, education of its people too. But anyway, by, we'll get to critiques later. But by and large, yeah, socialism is this notion that, no, we should all be working for the collective good. And the best way to do that is um, through you know, state control of stuff. And then we get to the, the odd man out, so to speak, of communism, because it's just not thrown around as much anymore. And that's probably because it's never been done. Like, like people say communist, but there's no country that's ever really adopted communism. Communism, by definition, is where the means of production is owned by everyone collectively. Not the state, not individuals, everyone. And it, it, it sounds nice, but it, and I'm not saying like, oh my gosh, we could never do something like that. I, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But it's just never been done. And so it's, I don't know how realistic it is to argue too much one way or the other about it. Um, and the central idea here, to I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly close to socialism in, this, in that there's an emphasis on the collective good. Um, I think, I think um, supporting communism is this notion that every person's labor belongs to that person. And so for you, for a laborer to work, especially at low wages, and then somebody else to profit off that work uh, is exploitation of that person. And I think there's some merit to that. I, I, I think I couldn't accept that whole, just at face value, because I could argue against that too. But okay, so I, I appreciate this notion um, uh, that we, you know, that society should be arranged such that people aren't exploited, and communism's take on that is therefore everybody should own everything. And when I say that, it sounds so unrealistic. But I'm going to tell a story later of how, how it actually kind of played out in a very uh, accidental way that that I find very interesting. But for the most part, people don't talk about communism. I don't think that much anymore. Um, you know. So in a nutshell, that's what those are. And, and I don't think I've said anything that's that's probably much of a surprise to anybody listening. Um, and at the risk of not surprising you further, let me um, cover briefly what are some, some critiques about, about these, generally speaking. So capitalism. Um, is it true that greed is good, that we're all inherently self-serving, and the system needs to allow for that, and... Uh, through market forces, the best will happen, yada, yada. Well, are humans inherently self-seeking? I think so, maybe. Um, you know, we're shaped a lot by our environment. And so I was, you know, uh, it's hard for me to see outside of the way I was conditioned to see things. So maybe, maybe not. Um, are people capable of being more than just self-serving? And that's what I absolutely believe in. I think humans are capable of anything. I think we're capable of accepting the worst atrocities as just the way things are, as long as that's what our social surround accepts. And I think you can look through history and say, wow, how was it in the past that people were so awful to each other and they accepted it? Because, because we learn, from, we, we adapt to our social surround in a lot of ways. And sometimes you'll get people that question some things, but for the most part, yeah, there is a lot of that. But therefore, if, if humans are capable of being just horrible, are they capable of, of, of seeing beyond themselves? And I, you can point to that. I mean, uh, whenever we become parents, uh, I think um, almost everybody uh, experiences what it's like to see something beyond themselves. Because if it's never happened before, certainly you're at a point then that you care about something more than you care about yourself. And... You know, I think it's 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 easy for me to conceive that we could develop a culture to where we were all interested in just everybody collective best interest. Not that not that we have to lie to ourselves and say that we 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 don't have any self interest or I don't love my children more than I love somebody else. Of course, we're going to do that, but there's a way to mitigate that, right? So I so I disagree with the premise that humans necessarily are born greedy. I certainly disagree with the premise that that greed is good. 
Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Ayn Rand. Um, but re actually, regardless of that, I'm not sure that even really matters. The, the challenge of capitalism, I'm not going to say the critique of it. I mean, everything can be critiqued. I'm just saying a challenge that capitalism has to wrestle with is the competition market forces do not yield the most efficient processes or the best products. And I think we can all look, look to recent history at examples for that. What they reward is somebody that for whatever reason figures out how to be successful. But that isn't necessarily by, by being the most efficient or having the best product. I mean, Microsoft Windows wasn't nearly the best operating system that was around, but they got the contract with IBM back when IBM was, was building the majority of personal computers, and then they were the operating system that everybody had to, to write software for, and then they just they found a way to corner the market. They, they, had, not a, they had virtually a monopoly, and they, so they took off. So... Yeah, that's what the free market does. It it rewards success, but success doesn't mean best for anybody except for the few that are benefiting from it. Um, number two, the, what the free market alone doesn't doesn't account for is once people are successful, once you amass enough power, money or whatever, the power within the system, now you can change the rules and you can make sure that the system benefits you. And so it, it, it's never a level playing field. It's never a you know, an equal fair fight and the best thing wins, which is, again, that's the premise, right? The fight, the, the, the market forces, the competition cause the most efficient or the best product to win. That's simply not true. What wins is whatever had the best way of winning the game, period. And it's not about being the best product or being the best for the world or anything else. Now, I'm not certain that that critique means you have to jump and say, well, let's not have competition and free market forces. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it's not a perfect system. And so to treat it as an ideology, to treat it as a truth is just really harmful and, and, and I don't think justifiable uh, for me. But to look at it as a system that, that has, has some good things about it, some really useful things, then yeah, absolutely. Um, and capitalism run amok. Yeah, the problem I have is I, I think, I think uh, we always compare our current situation with, it's always relative to where we are now. None of us ever want to get worse than we are now. And we, a lot of times, if we're comparing ourselves with others, which is not something that may or may not be part of human nature, we might be able to move away from that. But if we're comparing ourselves with others, it's always comparing with what we perceive to be our peers. So that means when you get richer and richer and richer in the system, people seem to never get to the point where they're like, no, geez, I have enough. I've got so much. You know, maybe I could pay my workers a little more. <laughs> maybe I could do whatever. And and it's it's not the case because they're not. You know, it's never enough because they're looking around at other people that are that are even more wealthier or or whatever. So capitalism run amok. And when I say run amok, I mean capitalism without very specific constraints that make, for instance, so that that preclude monopolies, um, that preclude exploiting vulnerable people. Um, you know, when capitalism doesn't have those kind of constraints, I think it, it can yield really ugly things. But then you have socialism and, you know, common, common critiques against that are, well, if, if it's all everything about the collective good, then it, it just robs me of any incentive to try. And it's not just that society needs me to try. It's that life isn't worth living if I'm not trying. <laughs> like, I want something to, to strive for, to care about. I want, to, I want something to give me the best. Um, and so the critique of socialism is if everything's just spread evenly and everybody gets the exact same amount, no matter how good they are, how hard they work, anything else, then everything's going to fall apart. And this was Ayn Rand's big thing. And this is like, you just hear it echoed so much. I, th I think very few people actually read Ayn Rand, but everybody echoes her, her, her shallow philosophy. So a number of things. One, again, socialism is often in contrast to capitalism, um, Capitalism rewards people with money. And there's a lot of ways that, that we could be rewarded and, and people would strive. It doesn't have to always just be about money. So, hey, number one. Two, yeah, this, this notion to the extent that if everybody, if it was true that socialism meant everybody got this exact same amount, yeah, that would, in some ways, that would be 
horrible, or at least it would have to be a totally different way of perceiving the world than, than I can imagine. Um, but I'm not, but the way that socialism plays out in most countries and economies where they call themselves socialists, they're not really socialists, they're capitalists with a lot of social structures, with a lot of social supports. Um, I think you'd find very few, very, very, very few places where the property is owned by the states. And, and very places that call themselves socialists, that the, the, the means of production is owned by the state. Um, so, um, but I appreciate the, the critique that, yeah, it, to the extent that, that effort doesn't matter, that, that, that would just be a bad existence. Uh, I'm not sure that most people that, uh, that are arguing for socialism, I think a lot of times they're just trying to show a contrast to ways of thinking inherent in capitalism, most of them aren't actually saying we want everybody to have the same thing. And to the extent they are, that's that's a different argument. Another critique is that you know government ruins every everything government touches gets ruined, and I'm just not sure that's necessarily true. Like it's it's a truism now. Like you just hear it all the time. Like oh, you know we don't want the government, we don't want to privatize healthcare because then it'll be ruined. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of good arguments that healthcare is pretty broken in the United States right now. And if you look at countries where it is um, state-sponsored healthcare, that it, it functions every bit as well without all the all the, the extremely high costs. So there, there are plenty of things that government seems to work pretty good on. I mean, we have a lot of social services that, that function pretty well. And on the last few years, people have been trying to, to beat up the post office um, for not making money. The post office was never meant to make money. It's a service that's very important. Um, it was, especially by the founding fathers, was perceived to be very important that we have this service. And what the post office is able to do is, is amazing. Um, so could that be done privately? Maybe. But I like the idea of a non-private company uh, having a way of sending mail that, that doesn't run through a private company. Anyway, so those common critiques against socialism and against communism, I mean, nobody's really done it. I mean, the, the thought of um, having a system where everybody owns stuff is, is hard to, to even fathom. So as I mentioned before, I, I really think the problem isn't that capitalism or socialism uh, or even communism have nothing to off, offer, offer. I think the problem is when they get treated as ideologies, as they're the truth because of whatever reason. And I think whenever you take anything and treat it that cleanly, it, it wreaks havoc in when it comes to real life, messy realities. Um, I would say with that, that any system has to account for those who try to abuse it. So the fact that when I argued earlier saying that, you know, in capitalism, people who gain power then very easily can use it just to make sure the game is rigged and they get more and more power. That isn't necessarily a critique of capitalism as much as that's a, a pointing out of a weakness in the system that would need to be abused, that would need to be abused, <laughs> that would need to be accounted for. Uh, and the same thing with the critique of socialism is for somebody to say, you know, if we have a system that works to benefit everybody, what do you do with those people that, that don't want to contribute to it? They just want to benefit from it. Yeah, I agree. But in the same way, that's not necessarily a critique of it. That's a, this is a way it can be abused. And I think that's a never ending process because I, I really do think no matter what system we have, and we always have a shared, like, a, you know, a shared system, or at least we do so far. We have capitalist and socialist um, aspects of, of, our, of our social economic system here. No matter what you have, there's always a current way to exploit it, uh, to take advantage of it, to have it benefit you without you contributing to the system. And I just think you just have to constantly be on guard for it. But again, then you have to have regulations. And so you can you can see where I'm coming, where it's like the free market, we're like, no, just let things go, I think would just would result in just tyranny. It would result in just the, 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 the strongest survive. And this notion like, um, yeah, but that's what the, that's what the, the that's what the uh, species needs, the strongest to survive. It's like, that's not really true. I think the reason that humans um, as a species kind of succeeded against other animals, um, I mean, it's not because we're the strongest, the fastest. I mean, arguably, maybe we're the smartest, but it's because we pulled together because we could coordinate our actions and then we did whatever. We worked together. 
And if you show me any society where people truly were independent and isolated, that society wouldn't accomplish anything. All the great achievements in human history came because, because of a coordinating of efforts together. And some real atrocities happened when this pooling of resources came with, um, by way of exploiting other people. So any great, any large empire, let's say the Roman Empire, yeah, they, they accomplished a lot. They had an amazing road system, an amazing, they, you know, they had a pretty cool aqueduct system. Um, they, they, they had architectural wonders. They, yeah, because they went around attacking places, conquering them, and taking all of their wealth back to Rome. And that's how they pooled the resources. And it was horrible. I mean, they were products of their time, whatever, but it was horrible. Slavery is like that. Um, there was a pooling of resources in a very inhumane way. The, uh, the exploitation of Irish and Chinese immigrants in, in building the first transatlantic railroad, um, trans transatlantic, <laughs> in building the first railroad across the country, um, transcontinental railroad, you know, the, that was horrible. It's still a pooling of resources, but it's horrible. And it doesn't have to be that way. We've had so many great accomplishments that didn't come about by exploiting people so much. Um, one of my favorite examples is um, when, the, when the, the Mormons first went out to what is now Utah before it was a state, and, and immediately they started building their, their big temple in Salt Lake City. And it took something like 100 years. I don't know how long it took, it took forever to build it. But, and whether there's exploitation there or not, I don't know. But the, but the labor was voluntary. And you're talking people that had nothing, and they built this incredible, beautiful building there. It wasn't slave labor. It wasn't, you know, lower than minimum wage labor. It was actually free labor, but it was freely given because people were inspired by the cause. The Human Genome Product Project. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that we've done as a society that wasn't ex exploitive, but was still a pooling of resources. NASA. Um, I mean, all these, these great things we've done. And so I don't like when, when I hear people talk about, like, you um, almost like we can justify inhumanity to, to, to other humans because it results in great good. And it has historically. C.K. Lewis did a, did a comedy bit on that. And I, I'm i not sensitive to comedy. I can laugh at anything. But I was like, I just disagree with, with the whole routine. If you look it up if you want to. Where he was just, he was saying, you know, maybe slavery is justified a little bit because good things came from it. And I'm like, yeah, but there's so many examples when you didn't have to be totally awful to other humans in order to pull your resources together and do some really cool stuff. So I've said over and over again that, that um, you know, the, the, um, the systems, if you will, of, of capitalism, of socialism, um, you know, they both come with a certain a reasoning behind them. And I think if you were inclined to justify either one of them, you could find reasons to justify them. If you wanted to critique them, you could find reasons to critique them. If you wanted to find historical examples of how each one did good, you could find that. And if you wanted to find examples of how each one caused suffering and harm, you could find that. The real problem is, is, is allowing that view, whether you, you capitalism or socialism or whatever, to become part of your identity, to say, and, and people don't say that, like my identity is the capitalist. But, but if, you, if you hear that threatened, if you hear somebody challenging anything, so across the board, anything, but in this case, capitalism or socialism, and you feel threatened by it, then I would argue that it's, that's formed part of your identity. And what we need to do is, is take them from, away from being something that's treated as if it's sacred. It's not sacred. It's just, just trying to figure out how things work and what system might work. And I, I think would, I would like to think that we haven't come up with the best system for everything yet, that we have a lot of, a lot of capacities to, to imagine things that, that, that we haven't imagined so far. And that's why I always go back to, yeah, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, what is, what's good about capitalism? Why does it work well when it does work well? And what can we learn from that? And what can we use from that? And same thing with socialism, same thing with whatever. Let me end with the story just because I, I find this really funny, but I also I think it kind of supports my argument about um, just looking for, um, looking for what works and playing around with ideas and yada, yada. So I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family a very, very right-wing family, uh, very much capitalist um, mindsets. 
Uh, <clears throat> my dad owned uh, a series of businesses that were very successful. Um, when I first got out of college, I worked for him for a few years. And he got to the point where he was looking to retire. And he, uh, you know, he had five kids. Uh, some worked for the company, some didn't. And, you know, this was, if he was going to leave a legacy, a financial legacy to his children, this would be it. And he's like, and I, 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 this is what I'm gleaning from conversations with him. And I think he was thinking like, what's right? What's the right thing to do? Who do I leave the company to? Do I leave it? Do I leave it to my kids? And even though, you know, I had worked for him for a couple of years and, and other, my uh, brother who'd worked for him for a few years longer than that, we didn't really earn the company right? My dad and his business partner earned it. They, they started it. They put in the blood, sweat, and tears, took a lot of financial risks, um, came up with the ideas, yada, yada, yada. And what he decided, and I, 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 I completely agree with it. I thought it was so interesting. He basically said, you know what? I don't want to give this to my kids. Um, they didn't earn it. It's only going to spoil them. Uh, to ever get something that you didn't earn only spoils you. Um, so what he did was he created a, a, an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, that basically every year this ESOP, this entity, would buy from the two business owners a certain amount of their shares of the company at the current market value, whatever it was. And then to, be, to own the ESOP was completely based on you working at the company. Uh, uh, how long have you worked there? then you would just own shares, kind of like a, a mutual fund in a way, right? You just own shares of it based on how long you've worked there. And if you leave, you just automatically, you're, they liquidate. They're, there you go. Here's your money. Put it into your retirement plan. Do whatever you want. But only the people who own the company could be the ones who work there. And the idea was it'll take a certain number of years, and then the, the people who started the business would, would enjoy their capitalist return of, of being able to sell their business and make a lot of money based on what it was worth at the time. But then, even though he would never admit to it, he had converted it to a very communist structure, right? Where the owners of the company were the ones working in the company and only the ones working in the company. And I thought that was brilliant. I thought it was fantastic. And he did it, by the way. And then a few years later, he sold it. And then I remember I got a check because I had, I had worked there and I had shares in the ESOP, um, you know, for what, you know, it wasn't that much. But, but, the, but the idea, I thought that was really interesting. And you don't hear about that very often. And I'm not advocating for it. I think there's some problems, right? I immediately see the problem of if it's based on people working there a long time, then I would just make life hell for everybody else. So nobody else, everybody would quit. And there'd be me and only a couple others that worked there a long time. And then we would pretty much own the company. But like I said, every system has to be guarded against those who want to abuse it. But I love the thought that the, the, the most dyed-in-the-wool capitalist came up with this very communist way of thinking and that that was his solution and i think i think it had merits and, and my point is not that that was that's what we all should do but i'm like you know what we should do is let loose of these these just um uh insistences insisting that there's a certain way of seeing the world and this is true with a lot of different ways i'm talking purely economically in this maybe we'll have other videos on other ones but in a way of a system, a system for looking at the world. Economically, it's commonly right now in these isms. Those are human creations. There's nothing sacred about them. They're not true. They're not necessarily false. They're just not true. They're human creations that try to explain. And they're really, really useful. But they're not truth with a capital T. And, it's, and if we're ever going to get over this polarization problem we have, we need more and more of us to, to pull away from these in terms of our sense of identity with them. And then just hold them up and evaluate them and take the best of all worlds and whatever. So that's what I think anyway.